Good morning. Welcome to Grace Baptist Church. We're delighted you're here with us this morning. We want to sing this morning of God's perfect Passover lamb, praising Christ for his sacrifice on the cross for us. Let's begin by singing together, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Let's stand and sing it together, please. to Jehovah once for all the uh, is slain God's perfect lamb. Let's sing it together. Redemption of man, worship the Lamb of glory. Let's sing it together.
Well, we'd like to welcome you to Grace Baptist Church this morning. We're so glad that you joined us. Please take your Bibles and turn to the book of Exodus, the book of Exodus, second uh, book in your Bible. While you're finding your place, we'll go to Exodus 12. You know, you don't always know what's going on behind the scenes, and we always like to give praise reports when we have the opportunity. Uh, this past week, uh, yesterday, we had many great visits. Um, Johnny Cabezas and I, on one of our visits, went up to a, a girl named Nevaeh, and we had a card that said she had made a decision to trust Christ as Savior. So when I went to the door and began speaking with the family, I saw Nevaeh, and I said, did you make an important decision during VBS? And she said, yes, I did. I asked Jesus Christ to be my Savior. That's a pretty direct answer. So those of you who labored long and hard in VBS, we're seeing the fruit of your labor, and we thank God for that. And then another blessing yesterday, uh, as you know, we distribute a lot of food, and sometimes we have uh, niche things. For example, when the baby um, formula was nil and it was hard to get, uh, we had that baby formula for free and, and diapers as well, and it even made the news. Well, yesterday we had another diaper drive for needy families, and the mayor was here yesterday. And when I spoke with him, it was, it was wonderful because he said, my daughter just went to camp, and she, uh, it's his youngest daughter, and she got saved. So that's just, it's just good to hear things like that. God is still in the life-changing business. I trust you had a good time with your family July 4th. Maybe you did something special. Cheryl and I took some days off and wanted to show you a few things. This is why we go to the mountains. You don't get that sitting at your desk. The mountains are beautiful. We love to explore. We were up to about 11,400 feet there. And then not only that, but it's always wonderful. You got to listen to the sound effects here. It's a video, guys, if you can hit that. It, I hope so. I hope we load it as a video. Because I want you to see my wife crossing her very first stream. Not her first stream. Okay, maybe it didn't come through as a video. I don't have the technical knowledge, you know. Pardon? Okay. Well, anyways, I'll just go to the next one. You'll just have to ask Cheryl later about that, about her triumph crossing the brook on her Honda 150. And then uh, many of you know that uh, as a boy, I grew up with a canoe. And when they sold the farm here last fall, I went all the way back and picked up the canoe. And this is where Cheryl and I were Thursday night on this beautiful Lake Isabel. I hope that you get out from time to time, take some time with your family, vacation, see God's wonderful creation. We certainly had a good time last week, and we wanted you to rejoice with us about that. So as we think about that, our, we found our place in our Bibles now in Exodus chapter 12, Exodus 12. Out of respect for the reading of God's word, let's stand together as we read Exodus 12, starting in verse 1. Exodus 12. And the Lord spoke unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of the month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for the house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of souls or number of people. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. And you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts of the upper doorpost of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs shall they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor boiled at all with water, but roast with fire its head and its legs, and with the hinder or inward parts thereof. And ye shall... Let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. And thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded, and your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. Why? It is the Lord's Passover. It's the idea of readiness. Verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both men and beasts. But, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am 
the Lord. And the blood shall be for you for a token unto the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall, be, shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial. And ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. The Passover, a memorial of redemption. Let's bow for prayer. Father, thank you that as we study the Old Testament, we can see how it lays foundational theological groundwork for an appreciation and an understanding of Jesus Christ, his sacrificially shed blood on the cross, for which we praise you, God. Whether it's a young girl, nine years of age at VBS, whether it's a 14-year-old teenager who uh, is saved during a camp, or whether it's two adults saved in a hospital this past week, Lord, we rejoice that the gospel still saves. The gospel still changes lives. Thank you, God, for this memorial. Thank you for the power of the blood, the symbol of its purity, of its sacrifice, of its redemption. God, we praise you for all that you are doing, for the wonderful VBS we've had of recent, for uh, so many wonderful things happening. I thank you for men's prayer meeting yesterday lifting up different requests, trying to be in tune with this congregation and the spiritual and physical needs. May we continue to practice the one another's of Scripture, praying for one another, comforting one another. Lord, we do pray for revival and unity in our nation. God, we know that there are many good evidences of good things happening. And yet, Lord, I would pray for revival in my own heart, in this church, in our state, our nation, our world, that we might be part of the solution, pointing people towards Christ, towards the infallible word of God. We also pray for continued uh, VBS follow-up, Lord. Thank you for the four teams that went out yesterday, but may we have even uh, more that can go and follow up on these precious children who made spiritual decisions. Some without uh, a home church, a church that they would call their home. Lord, we also want to thank you for Treasure Mountain Bible Camp. We think of the tremendous opportunity. They have three major weeks left um, of combo camps and other rental camps. And then, Lord, we are praying to finish the lodge this year, to raise the money, as this is Ray and Donna Bauman's last year, to be actively involved. We pray, God, that this lodge could be finished, which would double the capacity of this camp to reach souls in this area. God, we thank you for the ministry of the week, for those who help our executive committee with, with our finances, our treasurer, um, our financial secretary, all of those who help us with, with credibility and accountability to be good stewards, Lord, of what is given monetarily through this church. May you bless these men as they oversee this ministry and give them wisdom in financial decisions outside of the budget. So, Lord, this whole service is yours. We give it to you, asking you to work in a supernatural way. For we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Well, now the risen Christ stands before the throne of God, interceding for those of us who know Christ as our Savior, we want to rejoice in that as we continue singing. You may remain seated as we sing before the throne of God above. Let's sing it together. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest who is in his love, whoever lives.
down. Cameron Rook is going to come and bring a testimony and song, a Lamb of God. Cameron? Okay. Your only son, no sin to hide, but you have sent him from your side to walk upon this guilty sod and to become the Lamb of God. Your gift of love they crucified, they laughed and scorned him as he died. A humble king they named a fraud and sacrificed the Lamb of God. O oh, Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the Holy Lamb of God. Oh, wash me in his precious blood, my Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. I was so lost, I should have died, but you have brought me to your side to be led by your staff and rod and to be called a Lamb of God. O oh, Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the Holy Lamb of God. Oh, wash me in his precious blood, my Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Oh, wash me in his precious blood, my Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Thank you, Cameron, and uh, thank you for everyone that provided special music today and worship music. Thank you, Sharon Culp, for filling in for Kelly. He's homesick. We need to pray for Kelly. And uh, thank you, uh, Warden Cheryl Smith, for coming back from the mountains and deciding not to stay there and uh, continuing here as our pastor. Well, how many are awake today? Raise your hand, please. If you're not awake, then I'm sorry. But if you take your Bibles and turn to that text that Pastor introduced to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. Children, you are dismissed with your leader, Pastor Ward Smith and Cheryl are going to lead Children's Church today. And so I'm sure that some exciting things there for you. Well, today we celebrate the Lord's Supper. We look forward to these times that we set aside and here at Grace Baptist Church, about five to six times a year is our goal. And it's a time of commemoration. It's a time of proclamation. We show forth the Lord's death till he comes. It's a time of examination. We'll be saying more about that. It's one of the two ordinances of the local church, the Lord's Supper or communion and baptism established early on there, the Church of Jerusalem. So we might ask the question, beyond just that particular explanation, why does the church observe the Lord's Supper? Why does the church observe the Lord's Supper? Please turn on the microphone. So I say again, why does the Lord, why did the Lord establish his supper, and why does the church observe then what we call the Lord's Supper? Supper. So let's review. Thank you very much, Sound Booth, for keeping me on track. I did dismiss the children. I just didn't turn on my microphone. So the Lord's Supper is a picture or a symbol of the New Covenant. The New Covenant, the New Testament, in contrast to the Old Covenant or the Old Testament. When Jesus introduced or established the Lord's Supper, he said, this is the New Covenant. This is the New Testament in my blood. 
And uh, we're going to find it in four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, alluded to in John 13 after Jesus washed the disciples' feet. Uh, the Bible says that he served the bread to Judas. And, of course, we know where Judas took it from there. And so the Lord's Supper is mentioned in all four Gospels. And then the Apostle Paul reiterates in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 23, where we read, as, the, as Paul said, I've received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. So the same night in which Judas betrayed our Lord and the night before his passion on the cross, Jesus gave the object lesson of the Lord's Supper. It's a practice that uh, we observe as a memorial. That's spelled out there in Exodus chapter 12. It is a memorial. It's an act of worship. We see here on the communion table, do this in remembrance of me. There are certain things that God would have us to forget, to leave our sin behind, and to press toward the mark because God forgets our sin, but there are other things to remember, to call to remembrance. A memorial is for the purpose of remembering something very significant. And then finally, the Passover is a picture of Christ. The Passover then is a picture, a symbol, really an object lesson showing who Jesus Christ is and what he accomplished. There was a Jew, a converted Jew named Alfred Edersheim. He lived in the 1800s. He was born in Vienna, Austria. He learned to speak English at an early age. And he went to uh, Scotland and studied after he was converted through a chaplain's message in Hungary. Alfred Edersheim, tremendous Bible scholar. He wrote several different books, including The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah and The Temple, Its Ministry and Services. In the second book, The Temple, Its Ministry and Services, Alfred Edersheim said this about the Lord's Supper or about the Passover. There are peculiarities about the Passover which make it as the most important and indeed takes it out of the rank of the other festivals, the other feasts, three main feasts of the year that the Jews observe beginning with Passover followed by the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It was the first of the festivals during which eventually all the men of Israel to appear at the temple. Second, it, closely, it was closely tied to a very important event in Israel's history, the exodus from Egypt. And third, it is important as a type, an illustration of eternal spiritual significance, salvation. So the Passover is a picture of Christ taking the salvation or the deliverance of Israel from Egypt, and then through Christ, our salvation, our deliverance from sin, ourselves, from an eternal hell, and to be able to have a place in heaven prepared for us. And so my goal today is to be able to review the Passover, a picture of Christ, so that as we observe the Lord's Supper, uh, Supper we can have an especial appreciation and commemoration for all that Christ is, all that he has accomplished for us. And that as we enter solemnly into the partaking of the bread and the drinking of the cup, we will remember his broken body. We will remember that the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, is us from all sin. So back to Exodus. I'd like to read from Exodus chapter 11, preceding chapter 12, as we review what's happening there in Egypt. This is going to be the tenth of uh, uh, ten plagues that God brought upon Pharaoh and upon the people of Egypt because they refused to let God's people go. Moses said, let my people go that we may go out into the wilderness and worship the Lord, sacrifice unto the Lord. Pharaoh had hardened his heart. And so now God is going to bring the most severe, the most significant plague of the ten plagues. Chapter 11, verse 1, the Lord said unto Moses, Yet will I bring one plague more upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. Afterwards he will let you go from here. When he shall let you go, he shall surely thrust you out from here altogether. Verse 4, 
And Moses said, Thus saith the Lord, About midnight will I go out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sits upon his throne, even to the firstborn of the maidservant, who is behind the mill, and all the firstborn of beast. There shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there was none like it, nor shall be like it any more. But against any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue against man or beast, that you may know how that the Lord doth put a difference, a distinction between the Egyptians and Israel. And all these thy servants shall come down unto me, bow down themselves unto me, saying, Get thee out, and all the people that follow you. And after that I will go out. And he went out from Pharaoh in a great anger. So this is the setting here. We know the story. That God gives these very clear and distinctive commandments to Moses and to the children of Israel. Prepare for an event that you've never seen before. It's going to deal with Pharaoh. It's going to deal with the nation of Egypt. Egypt will never be the same as a nation after this event. It will be so significant. The Passover. That's going to be the observance of the Israelites to shed the blood of an animal, to apply the blood of that animal to the doorposts, the lintels, and then as the death angel passes over to kill the firstborn, he's not going to stop at the houses of those who by faith have applied the shed blood of a substitutional, a substitutional animal. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. But there are five significant things about the Passover as a picture of Christ that I would like for us to see today. And the first is this, that the Passover represented a new beginning. The Passover represented a new beginning for the nation of Israel. Actually, it was the beginning of this nation as they were to leave Egypt go to the Red Sea, cross the Red Sea by the power of God to go out into the wilderness on the way to the promised land. It was the beginning of the nation that we know as Israel. The Passover feast marked a new age in the history of Israel. Though the events in this chapter occurred in the seventh month of the civil year, Passover was to ultimately be observed in the month Abib, called Nisan later on by the Babylonians or the Jews coming down from Babylon after the exile. And Abib or Nisan corresponds to our months of March and April. That's when we celebrate Easter. Easter is dictated according to the year, according to the position of the moon, and, and so it's on different dates. But historically, with regard to the Jewish calendar, it was a new beginning. God said, you're going to make this the first month of the year. It's going to be the first month of the religious year. So it's going to establish a new identity for Israel as the favored people of God. You say, well, that's wonderful, that's history, that's, uh, that's the story of the Passover, and that's the story of God's command to Israel, but what does it mean to us today? The Passover is a picture of believers who obtain a new beginning. How do we obtain that new beginning? When we are born again by the power of God's Spirit, John chapter 3. We have a new name written down in glory. We have a new name called Christians that we go about and we're not ashamed, as Paul said, of the gospel of Christ. We have a new identity. The calendar changes in our life. We might have a time before we were saved. Now we have a time after we're saved. And for all eternity, we have a fresh start and a new beginning following the example of the Passover. So the Passover, a picture of Christ represented in Israel as a new beginning. They turned the calendar. I ask you this question this morning. Have you turned the calendar in your life with the fact of inviting Jesus Christ to be your Savior? Or are you still living in the old man? Are you still living in Egypt with all of its sin and with all of its worldliness and looking to the world to satisfy your needs, to satisfy your longing rather than looking to Jesus Christ? 
Can you point back to a time when you had a fresh start in Christ? Have you had a new beginning? Do you have a new name? Are you looking toward heaven or are you looking toward this world to satisfy today? The Passover, a picture of Christ with a new beginning. Secondly, the Passover pictures Christ with the sacrificial lamb. A sacrificial lamb. In verse 3, God said to Israel, Speak unto all the congregation through Moses, saying, In the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb according to the house, according to the family, a house, or that is a lamb for every house, every family. If the household of the family is too little, that is, there are not enough family members to sacrifice one lamb, then you can share it with your neighbor. Your lamb shall be without blemish. A male of the first year, ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. Ye shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Now there's a number of things to observe here. This sacrificial lamb was carefully selected by the father of the house. And this lamb was then to be brought into the house on the 10th day of the month and kept until the 14th day. So the lamb was kept for four days in the house. Do you realize it could become a, become a pet in that period of time? That the children might even name the lamb? The lamb became very intimate to this family. But it was to be set aside for one purpose. That lamb was to be sacrificed. Its blood was to be shed. And that lamb was to be a vicarious sacrifice for their salvation. Literally, their deliverance from the death angel who would pass over. There was a selected lamb. I read where in the Jewish priesthood later on in the practice of the Passover that the, the Jews had a 50-point checklist for the specificity of this lamb to be a whole, without blemish, spotless lamb as much as man could be able to ascertain. Wow. Spotless, without blemish, without obvious defect. Young, a male, a yearling, literally son of a year. It was tested, it was kept for four days. And during this time, the family was tested as to whether or not they would not just act out of emotion, but they would indeed follow through and sacrifice this lamb on the 14th day. It was sacrificed at twilight, literally between the two evenings. Josephus says between 3 to 5 p.m. they practice sacrificing the lamb on Passover. And our Lord was sacrificed approximately 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So there's an obvious picture here with regard to the sacrificial lamb. Jesus, chosen by the Father, Ephesians 1 says, from the foundation of the world, God had already determined that His only begotten Son would be that sacrificial lamb for you and for me and serve as our sin substitute. The lamb was to be spotless. Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 18 that we're not redeemed with corruptible things, silver and gold. We're not redeemed by the traditions of our fathers. We're not redeemed by ceremonial laws. We're redeemed by the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Jesus was tested in the wilderness. Jesus was tested in that he fulfilled the law of Moses. He fulfilled all the prophecies of the prophets. Jesus fulfilled the prophecies of the Psalms concerning himself. And he lived a perfect life. And out of obedience to the Father, he went to that cross. And he was nailed there. And he poured out his blood as a sacrifice for our sin. Jesus was young Jesus, at the height of his manhood, at 33 years of age, died on the cross. 
And as Josephus mentioned, approximately 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Jesus was a complete fulfillment, a picture of a sacrificial lamb as John saw him coming on the scene in John chapter 1. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus fulfilled that Old Testament picture. And so in the Passover, we see the picture of Christ with a new beginning, with the sacrificial lamb, and then in the appropriating blood, with the appropriating blood. The Passover, appropriating blood. We know that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. God required the shedding of blood. Why did God command a blood sacrifice? I don't understand completely, but you go all the way back to Leviticus chapter 7, and there Moses said, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission, there's no remittance, there's no payment for the forgiveness of our sin. And we learned that again. As it's quoted in the New Testament, the book of Hebrews, almost all things in the law in the Old Testament law, was purged with blood and without the shedding of blood. There is no remission of sin. The blood was a sign of faith. The Hebrews could know what they were supposed to do, but did they go ahead and do it? That's a sign of their faith and obedience. Verse 7 from Exodus 12, And they shall take of the blood, strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat it. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, will smite all the firstborn, and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. The blood was literally the means of their salvation. Without the blood on the doorpost, they would not have been passed over by the death angel. They would have lost their firstborn, both in the family as well as their livestock, just like the people of Egypt did that, not, that did not respond by faith. So in this concept, we see that the blood is literally providing for the children of Israel salvation from the plague of sin. Egypt was representative of sin. The children of Israel ultimately got out into the wilderness and they began to moan over the leeks and the garlics of Egypt, representative of all those things that they felt like would satisfy them in this life. And so God meant for this time in history for the children of Israel not only to be saved physically, but to be saved from the very consequences of sin. God wants to save us from the consequences of sin in our lives. Someone said long ago that you can choose your sin, but you can't choose the consequences. And Satan with his deceit makes sin look very inviting. Let me at least test this. Let me at least be tempted by this. Let me get as close as I can to this and see if it satisfies. But then sin can grip us and bring consequences that we never, ever would have chosen if we could have seen those in advance. And so God wanted to save his people from the plague of sin, from the destroyer. Of, uh, by death because of sin. So salvation from the penalty of sin. We know what the Bible says in Romans chapter 6 that the wages of sin is death. And it would have been death for every Jew, every Hebrew that did not apply the blood. And the wages of sin will be death for you and me if we've not allowed God to appropriate the blood into our hearts by faith. On Friday, during Food Bank, we have an English Bible study that meets in the Grace Center, and we have Hispanic Bible study downstairs. And I had the privilege of meeting with one lady who came to the English Bible study on Friday. Her name is Catherine. She's Chinese. 
And I practiced my message on Catherine. I told her up front, this is, you know, you're a guinea pig. And uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to practice on you a little bit. But I felt like if I could explain it to Catherine, being Chinese, though she can speak English, she can understand English, but, you know, some concepts and some things we take for granted and using words and illustrations. the Passover being a backdrop for Christ and for the Lord's Supper. And she said, what's a backdrop? And I said, well, I said, it's a background. What's a background? <laughs> I said, well, it's like if you had up here a picture of the Great Wall of China, and right here is a stage, and you had Chinese people walking around to make it look like that you're in China. It's a backdrop. It's a background. It's representative of something that maybe you couldn't understand otherwise. You try to make it look real. And so I was trying to explain to her how that the blood of these animals was appropriated by faith to be able to have salvation, deliverance by the power of God. And what does that mean to us today? And she simply did this. She said, she said, this was the blood of animals. This blood is in my heart. And that's exactly what she did. She went like this. She said, my heart. I couldn't have explained it or represented it any, any more clearly. That this blood is applied by faith. It's already been shed. But now the power of that blood appropriated by faith. The blood had to be appropriated before it could be appreciated. And how is that accomplished? By faith. By faith. So we learned this morning that the Passover, a picture of Christ, represents a new beginning. It, rep it represents the sacrificial lamb that Jesus became in the new covenant. And then we understand that the Passover is a picture of feasting on the lamb. We go back to Exodus 12, verse 8. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread. With bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat it not raw nor boiled with water. That's what the pagans did. They ate it raw. They were to be distinctive from that. But roast with fire its head, with its legs, and with the inward parts thereof. Ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. And that which remains of it until the morning you shall burn with fire. And thus shall he eat it with your loins girded. You've got your belt on. You've got your pants on. Your shoes on your feet. Your staff in your hand. You're ready to move. You shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. So what does this represent? Well, the Hebrews are going to go on a journey. They're going to leave Egypt in haste at the moment that God gives them the command, really at the moment that Pharaoh says, go, sacrifice to your God. They're going to go on a journey. They're going to need sustenance. The lamb was not only a sacrifice. The lamb res represented sustenance. They needed food to eat. They needed to be able to have strength for the journey. They were to eat the meat roasted. That represents purity. They were to eat the meat with unleavened bread, that is, without yeast. It's yeast or leaven which makes the bread rise, but they were to eat it simply unleavened because leaven represented sin. Leaven, again, represented the sin of Egypt that they were to come out from. It was a demonstration of separation. It was an illustration of repentance, turning from sin and turning through salvation to a God that they could trust. And they were to eat it with haste, ready to move at the accepted time. Again, some words from Alfred Edersheim and his understanding of the Passover. The family celebrating the Passover was to eliminate every form of leaven from their lives. The head of the house was to search with a lighted candle all places where leaven was usually kept and to put what of it he found in the house in a safe place, whence no portion could be carried away by any accident. Before doing this, he prayed, Blessed art thou, Jehovah, our God, 
Did you like that song this morning about Jehovah? We need to learn how to clap our hands here, and that would be a little more enjoyable. But blessed art thou, Jehovah our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us by thy commandments and commanded us to remove the leaven. And after his search, he said, all the leaven that is in my possession, that which I have seen and that which I have not seen, be it null, be it void, be it accounted as the dust of the earth. The search itself was to be accomplished in perfect silence with a lighted candle. Wow. It's representative of searching our lives, of examining our lives, and if there are any so-called spiritual morsels of leaven in our heart, in our lives, then we're to put it away, put off the old man, and put on the new man as we are renewed in the spirit of our minds. And as we go to the Lord's Supper today, we'll have a time of examination. In fact, the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that he that eats unworthily because he's eating with unconfessed sin is inviting judgment upon his heart and upon his life. And because of that, many are sickly and many are dead. That's a pretty awesome warning. And if the Jews took great pains to search out the leaven in their house before they partook of the Passover meal, how much more should we today understand that this is a solemn time? This is a solemn time, but we need to search our hearts. And only you and the Holy Spirit know what's in your heart today. That's not for me to understand. Leaven. An ingredient for cooking, not normally forbidden to the Jews, but in this case forbidden because it was representative of a past life. So they were to feast on the lamb, prepare for the journey. They were to eat it with bitter herbs, a picture of suffering in Egypt. They were to eat it with haste, ready to move at the accepted time. So again, we're reminded that believers need strength for the journey. You're here today, I'm here today, not only as a preacher, but as another believer and a member of Grace Baptist Church, because I need strength for the journey this week. What happened in your life last week? Was last week what you would call a good week? Was last week a challenge to you? I would imagine that everyone here today could say both, it was a good week in measure, but also there were challenge, challenges to you. And so we need strength not only on Sunday mornings. We need strength every day for the journey. Where is our strength? It is the Word of God. Jesus called Himself the bread of life. And the bread of life is represented for us today in the Word of God. We need to be continually feasting on the Lamb via His Word. Is the Word of God precious to to you today is it precious to me we're to be separate from sin we're to be ready to respond with instant obedience at the spirit's command you know if we have unconfessed sin in our lives and we go out from here today and not only with the fear of partaking of communion but we go out today and now in work tomorrow or in the home or with our children or on vacation, or whatever is ahead of you this week, and as you have opportunity to give a witness of Christ's saving grace in your life, if there's unconfessed sin, you're not ready for the journey. I'm not ready for the journey. We're not going to have the confidence to respond to the Spirit of God with instant obedience if we've not been feasting on the Lamb. Well, fifthly today, the Passover, in the very practice the very commemoration is a picture of God's will for us. As we observe the Passover today, and I just, as we display this picture, understand that as we take of the bread, we're taking from some little cracker crumbs, or we're taking some grape juice in a cup. In the Lord's Supper, Jesus passed one cup, and the disciples all drank from one cup. 
And actually there were three passings of the cup. And then, of course, there was the distribution of the bread. And they would pass around the loaf of bread. And they would take of that bread. And Jesus would remind them, this bread represents my body. And as it's broken from the loaf, it's representative of my broken body, which he fulfilled the next day through his crucifixion. And the cup is representative of my shed blood, which will be shed for you. So just these reminders today as we practice, as we commemorate the Lord's Supper. It's the Lord's Passover. That's what God told Moses there in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 11. It is the Lord's Passover. And indeed, that remains today, but it represents the New Covenant. It represents the New Testament in His blood. We remember Him. It's an it's a everlasting memorial. It's an act of worship. It's an opportunity, yes, to just consider today, Lord, what have you done for me? Lord, how grateful am I today for rescuing me from sin and the penalty of sin. It's an everlasting ordinance. God said to the Israelites in verse 14, This day shall be unto you a memorial. You shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. And Jesus reestablished that ordinance now called the Lord's Supper. And in that it becomes an object lesson to challenge children that the Lord's Supper indeed is an object lesson. Pastor Smith, when he preaches, he likes to give object lessons. We have an object lesson as we commemorate the Lord's Supper today. And in doing that, we can accomplish what God commanded to the Jews in Exodus chapter, one, or Exodus chapter 12. Verse 24, ye shall observe this thing for an ordinance to thee and to thy sons forever. And it shall come to pass when you come to the land which the Lord will give you according as he has promised, that you shall keep this service. And it shall come to pass when your children shall say unto you, what means this service? Why is this necessary? What is this all about? Then you shall say it's the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt, when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses, and the people bowed the head and worshipped. And the children of Israel went away and did as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, and so did they. So the Lord's Supper as the Passover is designed as a tool to challenge children to ask and to know the true significance of God's salvation. Someone said that the Lord's Supper is the gospel illustrated. His death, His resurrection proclaims the Lord's death till He comes, till He comes, that He is coming again. So we've looked at the Passover today as a picture of Christ. Just as the celebration of Passover was a time for the Jews, to remember the deliverance of Israel from Egypt and the destruction of the death angel. So the Lord's Supper is a time to remember our deliverance from sin and death by the sacrifice of Christ. And so my challenge to you today and for myself is that today as we observe, as we commemorate the Lord's Supper, that it will not just be a rehearsal, but that it will be real. Not as the Catholics that believe in transubstantiation, that somehow we have the literal body and the literal blood of Jesus in the elements. No, we believe this is a symbol. But I do believe the Holy Spirit of God can uniquely work in our hearts if we will cry out to Him and say, Oh God, bring a, a fresh understanding and appreciation and gratitude, Lord, today to me for all that you've accomplished for me. And God, I rededicate my life to live out this life in appreciation for your sacrifice for me. Let's bow our heads in prayer. In these few moments, as the Hebrews 
were to examine their houses for leaven. Would you, like me today, examine your house? The Bible says our bodies is the house, the temple of the Holy Spirit of God. And in this temple, we are to glorify God in our bodies. Is there anything there that would offend a holy God to which you have not claimed the appropriation of Jesus' blood as forgiveness for your sin? Is there anyone that you have offended? You know you have offended that person by speech, by action, by a failure to do something you promised? And maybe that's something that you need to take to the Lord today and then determine in your heart, when can I go to that person and make this right? Is there some idol in your heart some person or some thing that's become more important to you than the Lord Jesus Christ himself and all that he has done for you. And God would have you to put that idol on the altar this morning. Is there something that God, the Holy Spirit, has been prompting you to do? Maybe in an area of service here in the local church. Maybe an individual that you need to go to and say, Jesus loves you. And I want to tell you how God saved me so that he can save you. And you have you've been timid and have trusted your own strength rather than God's strength and power to use you to be a witness. Lord God Almighty, thank you for the pictures, the types that we have from the Old Testament. Thank you, Lord, that all those things that the Jews did back then still have great significance, and they were all fulfilled in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for your shed blood. Thank you for your broken body. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for patience. Thank you for love. Thank you for your power. Thank you, Lord, that this service is not ours. It is yours. Just as the Passover, the Lord's Supper, is the Lord's. So God, today, as we partake of the elements, I pray that we will not partake unworthily that if there's anyone here whose sins have not been put under the blood, have not accepted you as personal Savior, the Lord, right now in their seats, they can cry out to you, Oh God, I know I'm a sinner. I know that Jesus died for me. He took my sin upon himself. He was my sacrificial lamb. I believe that. I'm asking you to come into my life, be my Savior, be my Lord. Forgive me, forgive me of my sin. Prepare a home in heaven for me and help me to live for you. In Jesus' name, you can pray that prayer from your own heart. So that everyone here today that knows Christ as Savior, that has their sins under the blood, can partake of communion if they're walking in like precious faith with us here at Grace Baptist Church as we commemorate a close communion. And may it be that in Jesus' name. Amen. Men, would you come this morning, please?
to reiterate the message of the Passover and now the establishment of the Lord's Supper. We're reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. This is the Apostle Paul's account, and it makes it clear how he received this command. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23, Paul said, I received of the Lord that which also I have delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do, in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show forth the Lord's death. You proclaim, you preach the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whoever shall eat this bread, drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. So, men, would you stand, please? There's power in the cross. Thank you, Sharon. So Paul, repeating the words of Jesus, 1 Corinthians 11, 24, said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you in remembrance of me. They took the bread after they had given thanks. 
And so, Bill Culp, would you please stand and give thanks for Christ's broken body. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be here today and to celebrate communion, Lord. Lord, we thank you for your body that was broken for our sins, Lord, the blood that was shed, Lord. Help us to examine ourselves today, to take this ordinance seriously, Lord. Uh, the bread and the grape juice does not save us from sin, Lord, but it reminds us of your love for us. Lord, I pray that you would uh, bless the rest of the service today. Again, thank you for your body that was broken for our sin. For I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Jesus said, take, eat, this is my body. Again, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 
And verse 25, Paul said, after the same manner also, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament, the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. And so, Tom Iowa, would you please stand and thank the Lord for his shed blood. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this observance of the, one of the uh, commandments of Christ for which we celebrate by emulating his death and burial and resurrection on the cross for our sins. And we thank you, Lord, for giving us this, uh, this uh, practice. We ask, Father, that you would help us to uh, search our hearts. If there be any sin in us, that, Lord, you would purge it from us mm. as we partake of these holy elements. And we just thank you, Lord, for your grace and wisdom for giving us this opportunity to show forth our love for you during this communion ceremony. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Jesus said to his disciples, drink all of it. You'll find uh, in your seat backs in front of you a place to uh, put your communion cup this morning. Jesus, when he met with the disciples, uh, before they were dismissed, they sang a song. And so Pastor Joel is going to come and lead us in a song. The hymn writer said, My soul is purchased by his blood. My life is hid with Christ on high, my, with Christ my Savior and my God. Let's sing that last stanza of Before the Throne of God above. Let's stand and we'll sing it together. invite you at this time as you do each week. Uh, if you're a guest with us, we have a connection card in the seat back in front of you, and we'd love to have you fill it out this time so we can get you more information about our ministries here and a gift for being with us. And you can place those in the offering here in just a few moments. We are so delighted you're here with us at Grace. And then if you have a prayer request or an update, we'd like to pray with you as a church family. So I invite you to fill that out at this time. Again, place those in the offering in a few moments, and that'll be a way for us to uh, stay connected and pray for one another. So appreciate that. Uh, I'm excited to announce we are starting for, for many classes today a new series in our Bible study, Adult Bible Study Era classes. It's entitled Avoiding Confusion. And there are many um, things that have come into question today uh, in, our, in our culture, in our society. And so we're going to be looking at um, some, a very practical study. On, here's some of the topics we'll be discussing. Uh, the existence of God. How do we know there is a God? Uh, the reliability of the Bible. Uh, the deity of Christ. Also, um, other, other um, topics that we'll be covering, creation. What does the Bible say about that? How do we know that creation is true? The account in the Bible of creation is true. The presence of evil in the world. Where, where did it come from? Why, why is there so much evil and suffering if there's a good God? Uh, the sanctity of life. Uh, gender. What does the Bible say about that? Social justice. And there's many more. So this is going to be a very engaging study for us, a very important study for us. So you will not want to miss these, um, these classes in our next hour. So 11 o'clock, our five different adult Bible study hour classes. Uh, so hope you can join us for that. And then if you are newer to Grace, we would love to have you in our Welcome to Grace class. That also begins today. Pastor Smith will be leading that. It's in Grace Center, the room with the glass doors right behind the auditorium here. It's a seven-week class on each Sunday at 11 o'clock. And we'll go over the ABCs of the Christian life, um, why we believe what we believe here at Grace, how can you get involved, different things like that. So i uh, love to have you, at, you, you see Pastor Smith. Um, he's teaching the children this morning, but he'll be up in the foyer after the service. And love to have you be a part of that class. That begins today at 11 o'clock.
in Grace Center. Tonight, we have a singspiration for the adults. We're excited about that. Chance to sing praises, sing your favorite hymns and songs to the Lord tonight. So that's at 5 o'clock. And then, of course, the teens will have regular youth group downstairs uh, in the teen room at 5 o'clock and the Hispanic downstairs as well. That's tonight at 5 o'clock. Hope you'll join us for that. This Wednesday, we have a special guest speaker, Evangelist Jeff Farnham. Excellent speaker. You will not want to miss him uh, speaking to us this Wednesday night, 7 o'clock right here at the church. So hope you can join us for that. Well, this time I'll invite the uh, gentleman to come forward as we receive the offering. Uh, also want to mention today, especially uh, as we do each time we uh, remember... Um, the Lord's Supper with communion, we receive funds for the Deacon's Fund. This is a fund set aside so we can help uh, those in the community and especially here in our church that have financial need. Uh, and the Deacons are the ones that help us serve in that way uh, by administering those funds as needed um, and, and meeting with those folks. We want to be a blessing and a help to them as the Bible instructs us uh, carefully. So if you can, uh, would like to, to give towards that, just on the other line in the offering envelope, uh, you can just write Deacon's Fund and uh, all, the, all the funds on that line will go towards that fund um, as a part of this offering. So I'm going to ask Rob Burns, if you would, please ask the Lord's blessing on our offering this morning. Rob? Dear Heavenly, gracious Heavenly Father, dear Lord, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for the, the wonderful message that we heard the Passover Lord uh, thank you for your body and your blood thank you for your sacrifice that you died on that cross for us Lord I pray for the deacons fund Lord for uh, it to help and in a lot of ways, Lord, I pray for that right now. Uh, Lord, just go with us. Help us, lead us, guide us, and direct us. And Lord, just help us to do your will today and every day. And for us to keep looking up for you are soon coming. Lord, we love you, we praise you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we do have a verse of the month we're working on learning. It goes right along with our uh, theme that we heard about this morning. So let's go ahead and say the verse together, beginning with the reference, and uh, work on hiding that God's word in our heart. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. Amen. Well, let's go ahead and uh, close our service in prayer this morning. 
God, we're so thankful for Jesus Christ and his shed blood on the cross for us. Lord, we are so unworthy, undeserving. Lord, we are sinful uh, people uh, who were your enemies because of our sin. Yet you loved us and you sent your son to die for us in our place uh, to take our sin upon you um, so that you could redeem us, so that you could make us new creatures in Christ, uh, so that, you could, that we could enjoy a relationship with you and so that we could be changed to become like Christ. And one day we'll spend all of eternity with you. Uh, so we rejoice in that this morning. God, remember your sacrifice. Help us to live in light of, of these wonderful truths of the gospel. We thank you again in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You are.